Hi, this is the Sunday Evening Tropical Tidbit on Tropical Storm Ian. As always, the thoughts in this video are mine alone, and in making decisions, please consult the National Hurricane Center and your local weather office for the best information. This is Ian here, centered to the south-southeast of Grand Cayman, and we're at a point in Ian's development cycle where it has now recovered from the northeasterly shear that was impacting it while it passed south of Jamaica, and now it's making a turn more toward the northwest, and it took about a day or so for the vortex to start becoming more aligned vertically. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time after the shear uh, abates for the storm to respond and actually organize and get its structure uh, set up in a way where intensification can begin in earnest. This is the visible satellite zoom. I know the sun is setting here right at the end, but I do want to show you that there was a little surface spinner there. You can see it kind of moving toward the north-northwest. It was taking a little bit of a jog, a little bit closer to Grand Cayman than perhaps some of the prior forecasts expected, but a turn back toward the northwest to the southwest of Grand Cayman is expected in the short term and the reason for this jog could be that there is still or has been at least to this point today a little bit of a tilt in the vortex the mid-level center was probably a little bit to the northwest of this surface spinner as it was coming up so we do expect this to pinwheel around that mid-level center and align with it as it moves to the south of grand cayman ultimately uh, resuming a northwest heading uh, as it moves to the left of the island one thing we're noticing here as the sun sets, more convection beginning to fire off in a curved band kind of structure around where this center is observed on satellite. And those curved bands of convective bursts are an indication that uh, intensification is likely to begin soon because they are close into the center and therefore uh, they are efficient at heating the core and causing pressure falls and increases in winds. This is the recon data from a plane that just entered the storm and what we see right away here is that the pressure is 992 millibars. That's a full 10 millibars uh, lower than the prior plane's mission, indicating that strengthening has likely begun tonight. And what I'm seeing here is that there's a band of strong wind just to the southeast of that center position and a band of strong wind just to the northwest of the center. These are both compact and close to the center. This indicates a well-defined maximum wind radius where you have weak winds increasing and then decreasing again after the maximum wind point. This indicates a compact inner core structure is beginning to form and is the telltale sign that Ian is about to strengthen and we expect that strengthening to occur rapidly. So talking about the track forecast a little bit, this is the GFS Ensemble for Tuesday morning. This product shows red numbers, which indicate possible positions of Ian according to this 31 member ensemble. And you can see it's centered around Western Cuba on Tuesday morning. But I wanna show you how this compares to prior forecasts just from the last couple of days, which were much larger envelopes of possibility. And we had all sorts of solutions that were much slower, farther south and west, and now we have a much more focused and compact set of possibilities near Western Cuba. And this is in much better agreement with the European ensemble, which is also more compact and near Western Cuba. And you can see that they're now close together here on the entry point that Ian will take into the Gulf of Mexico. This is a significant narrowing of the track forecast possibilities from even yesterday and certainly the days before that. And that's because we got Ian, past this point south of Jamaica that I've been talking about, and now we're seeing the storm organize, become vertically stacked, and the models have a better handle on the structure of the system. And so now we're seeing the track become higher confidence uh, as we move it across western Cuba and into the southeastern Gulf of Mexico. Now here's the 500 millibar forecast from the GFS. And if you've been watching the videos for the last couple of days, we've talked about this big upper level trough over the northeastern US, which is going to modulate how much Ian feels a pull toward the north or northeast toward Florida. And you can see where the hurricane is here on Wednesday afternoon on the model. We have a big steering ridge to the east with southwesterly flow that helps usher the hurricane toward the north. And the edge of the steering ridge will be modulated by how deeply this trough digs and kind of forces the steering flow to turn toward the east as opposed to remaining towards the due north. Now, if you look at the last couple of runs on the GFS, you'll notice that the base of this trough was yesterday forecast to be over West Virginia and Maryland. But if you look at the most recent run, you see it digging a little bit more over Virginia 
and North Carolina. And so this is setting the edge of this ridge a little bit farther toward the east and reorienting the surface or the steering flow more out of the southwest, helping to turn the hurricane a little bit farther east. And if you look at the last few runs of the GFS, look at that shift. The hurricane was farther out over the Gulf a couple of runs ago. Now we've seen a shift much closer to the Florida Peninsula on Wednesday. Now some of this is due to the launching position because the GFS now passes over western Cuba, whereas a, a day or two ago it was out over the Yucatan Channel. So we have seen a shift not only in the trough, the steering influences, but also the initial position of the storm entering the Gulf of Mexico. Both of those combining to bring this closer to western Florida on recent runs. There's also a little bit of a difference in the push on it from the subtropical jet. That's this airstream in teal that you can see coming into the western Gulf of Mexico off of the, uh, the Mexican area here, pushing on the hurricane. And you can see kind of the edge that gets set. The flow comes in and then gets redirected toward the north. If you look back on the last couple of runs, this edge was set farther west and this airstream was being diverted a little bit farther to the north, therefore not pushing on Ian quite as much. But on recent runs, this has become more similar to the European model and is now pushing on Ian a little bit more, helping to nudge it closer to Florida as it makes its way toward the north. This is the European model where you can see a little bit more southwesterly flow hitting Ian on the left side, and that pushes the hurricane a little bit closer to the Florida coastline than on the GFS, moving right over Tampa Bay and then just crawling up the coastline into the Big Bend area and then eventually inland very slowly. Whereas on the GFS, you can see it's staying a little bit west of Tampa Bay, eventually ending up in the Steinhatchee Alligator Point area of the Big Bend section of the Florida coastline. But the big point here is look at how much closer together the GFS and European are now than they were just yesterday and the days prior, where we have the GFS here, European here, very close now. So we are seeing a narrowing of the track forecast guidance for Ian. And while there is some sensitivity here in terms of exactly what portion of the Florida coastline might get a hurricane landfall, it is a lot narrower than before to the point where we're pretty confident this is going to be a Florida kind of event. We're less worried today, I think, about tracks that could wildly deviate more toward the west into the central Gulf Coast or wildly to the east, more into southeast Florida. It's really kind of this lane that is being looked at, and you'll see that in the NHC forecast here in just a second. Now, the other thing to talk about is the intensity of a potential landfalling hurricane. This is the H-Wharf showing Ian moving northward as a strong hurricane, and you'll notice that it, it reaches a maximum intensity here in the southeastern Gulf of Mexico where conditions are favorable. But as this comes north, uh, you'll notice that weakening starts to happen. The pressure value rises in the center, and we see dry air showing up on the southern side of the system due to very strong southwesterly shear that is waiting for it in the northern Gulf. We talked about this extensively yesterday. This is the southwesterly jet that essentially extends along the North Gulf Coast. And as the hurricane comes up, you see it reach these teal colors and shear picks up a whole lot. If we draw a box on the storm here and take a sounding, we'll see a profile of the steering flow with height. And when steering flow changes with height, that is a wind shear by definition. You'll see that there are easterlies in the lower levels and then very strong southwesterlies aloft. And that is a very strong shear gradient. You can see almost 50 knots at this time on the model which would be detrimental to any hurricane, no matter how robust. And so we see this now in a lot of modeling, including the GFS, where you'll notice that uh, the pressure value on the GFS here, it's 950 millibars, and it comes up the coast, and before landfall, you see it rise to 980 millibars, indicating some fairly significant decay of the hurricane prior to making landfall. So the risk here for Florida is that in terms of raw wind and surge impacts from the eyewall of a hurricane, uh, the farther south the landfall, the stronger the system is going to be. For example, on the European model, the storm doesn't get as far north before hitting land, so we see it stronger than we see it on the GFS at landfall. So if we get a track toward the panhandle, likely to see a, a weakening hurricane, perhaps rapidly weakening hurricane on its way in. This is the latest forecast from the National Hurricane Center showing a lot of the things that we talked about, a little bit of a shift closer to Grand Cayman where a hurricane warning is in effect. We're seeing Ian begin its rapid development now, so it could be a hurricane by the time it passes at its closest point to the island, and then hurricane warnings for western Cuba as well. 
where intensification is expected to continue essentially throughout this crossing of the island. Now, often Western Cuba will disrupt hurricanes temporarily. It's normally not a long interruption, given that the island is thin and does not have tall mountains like the central part of Cuba does. So the hurricane may see momentary pause in strengthening, and then it typically resumes in short order on the other side. So we are expecting peak intensity to occur in the southeastern Gulf of Mexico, where conditions are favorable up until about this line, but north of that, conditions become significantly more hostile for the hurricane as it moves northward. So we do see some weakening on the Hurricane Center forecast going from an M to an H, indicating a uh, decrease in intensity below major hurricane threshold, which is 115 miles per hour, but this would remain a strong category two on this official forecast. And uh, the landfall intensity in Florida here, as we talked about, will be modulated by how far north that landfall occurs. If it's in the panhandle, it will be a weaker storm because it will be moving into more hostile conditions for a longer period of time before making landfall. But if the landfall is farther south over the central Florida coastline, then it would be a stronger hurricane and direct wind impacts would have a bigger role to play at the landfall location. But I wanna stress that the entire state of Florida, especially the Florida Peninsula, could see significant wind and water impacts no matter what the details of the eyes track is, because as this comes up to the west of the coastline or into the coastline, we'll have a prolonged period on the east side of strong winds, heavy rain, and persistent pushing of water toward the coastline as the hurricane moves northward. And some of these areas are low lying, and especially if the hurricane moves up into the Big Bend area, we could still see significant storm surge flooding with ocean water near the coastline, even if the maximum winds are in the process of weakening as the hurricane moves in. And I want to highlight here how slowly the hurricane is really moving on this forecast. This is 2 p.m. Wednesday. 24 hours later, it's here. 24 hours later, it's here. So two full days to get from here to here. That's a fairly slow moving storm. And that means a prolonged event with big impacts on the east side of the storm and then potentially up into the panhandle, depending on how far west the eye tracks. And the reason for that is if we look at the GFS again, the 500 millibar steering, as this trough pulls out, the hurricane, which is feeling southwesterly steering flow here, starts to feel the impact of this ridge over Texas building in toward the east as the trough pulls out. So we get northerly flow opposing the southerly flow to the east, and these two kind of cancel out in a way, and the steering flow gets weaker, so the hurricane slows up as it moves into the Big Bend area of Florida. So that's the risk here. A prolonged period of impacts could be coming for the state. The good news in a sense is that we've narrowed the range of possibilities significantly relative to the last couple of days. Once we got the storm past Jamaica, like I've been talking about, confidence is increasing. Unfortunately, that means we know who's getting a brunt of impacts, and that probably means here the state of Florida. So unfortunate here, but a big event is coming. And this cone of uncertainty here does a great job of conveying the realistic bounds of the possible, possible landfall locations here. Fort Myers to the Western Florida Panhandle feels about right based on the model guidance that we're seeing today. So we're not so worried now about tracks farther to the west and then moving into the central Gulf Coast. And we're not really worried about tracks coming directly up into the Keys. So really the central southwest Florida coastline up through the Panhandle is kind of the bounding box and anything in between could happen. And we will see shifts and we will see wobbles, but either way, uh, regardless of where the landfall is along the coastline, we will see impacts across the whole Florida Peninsula, freshwater flooding from rainfall, winds of tropical storm force or hurricane force will be possible over potentially a wide area. This is the probability swath of 40 mile per hour winds or stronger, everything in yellow is 30% or higher. So you see a big region of Florida could get strong wind, power outage problems. You can see that arriving essentially by Tuesday morning on this forecast at the earliest, potentially uh, Tuesday afternoon if the storm is just a little bit slower and then continuing up into the Big Bend area. And uh, you can see that it's a large area. And so the whole state and even beyond could get flooding impacts once the storm moves inland. And we'll have to be uh, vigilant about that. And hopefully everyone has a plan ready to go. Be prepared. If you're in a storm surge prone area along the, uh, the Florida coastline, pay close attention to the Hurricane Center's products over the next few days. They start running models that uh, will predict the water level rise to a greater degree of precision once we know where the landfall point will be. But this is a flooding prone area of the Gulf Coast. So everyone take it seriously if you are in a flood zone.
That's it for now, everyone. Thanks for watching.